Yeah. So, hey, but we're all here, authors. Um, I would love it so much if you could each introduce yourself. And can you pitch me your story in five words or less? And if you truly can't, 10 words is fine. But five words you get, you get bonus points. Remember the first time you saw yourself in a story? Someone who looked like you. Someone who sounded like you. Someone who hurt like you and dreamed like you. Someone who loved like you. Stories are powerful. They allow us to explore different worlds and to imagine better endings. They teach us to remember and they illuminate a way forward. They offer comfort in sadness and hope for tomorrow. They show us that we are valued, that we are never alone, that we belong. Stories enrich our lives. Bywater Books and Amble Press. We are all stories. All right, I'll call on you. Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Me? Moi? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Well, mine's not back from my... Um, well, yeah, it is. No, that's not true. I was going to say it's not back from the editor yet, so my blurb is likely to be 10 words, but I never got to see the edit, so... Oh, I meant introduce your story in 10 words or less. Tell me all about you. Oh, really? No, yeah, no. I mean, 30 well, my story, My story, um, it's, I'm sure it's probably <laughs> widely known that I'm not a spec fiction author, except the things I read by this August group of authors who have, uh, you know, tempted me to at least stick my toe in that river. Um, but, you know, when I got this assignment to write a story for this collection around the whole soul food idea, I thought, why not write a book about food that's about a, a story about food that's about food? So I figured, what does a famous food writer, um, the polio, the polio pandemic of 1954 and a whole bunch of goat cheese have in common? So that's what I went with. Excellent. Uh, Kathy, story. would you like to introduce yourself and pitch your story in five words or less? No, but I will. No, I will. Um, <laughs> I'm Please. Kathy Pega. My story is in Spiri Wood, and it's a prequel to my novel through Bywater, uh, The Demon Equilibrium. And it's the basically origin story of Sister Thomasina. If you're... Excellent. Yeah. All right, let's do Jen next. All right. Um... I, like Anne, have not really been a speculative fiction author. I have previously released only romance novels, so this was a bit of a detour for me. Um, and I took the theme very literally. So I guess my probably 10 words or less premise is my main character has her soul in a jar. What happens when it runs out? Nice. All right, Virginia. Hi. Virginia Black, Virginia Black writes, uh, here in the I Wish It Was Raining More Pacific Northwest, uh, my story in Soul Food is ravenous. I did do this in five words. The first taste is unforgettable. Uh, this is the story of the vampire Elisabetta, who uh, Elisabetta is a uh, cameo in my novel Consecrated Ground, and this was a fantastic opportunity to explore her origin story. Excellent. All right, let's do Jacob next. Hi, I'm Jake. I'm the official demon twink of Bywater Books. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and my, uh, my story of the air and land is in both Soul Food and my new collection of short stories, Tea Leaves Through the Amble Imprint. Um, and my five word pitch, exactly five words, is um, lesbian food truck wedding nightmare. Nice. Excellent. Nice. All right. And we will finish <laughs> off with Anna. And then I realized I should introduce myself too. Well, yes, you, you should have done that first, probably. That's okay. We could do it for you. Eh. Well, that that's fair, but let's do you first. Okay. Uh, I am Anna Burke. I do typically write speculative fiction. And I did not come up with a blurb as entertaining as the rest of you. Mine is simply don't eat the bread. <laughs> don't eat the bread incredible um and i will be your hostess sd simper 
I write a lot of horror, a lot of romance, a lot of spec fic, and uh, you can find my books by searching my name, S.T. Simper. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Wait, 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 um, wait. I, oh, what's up, just, Anna? I just, okay, I lied. I had made one up, but I couldn't remember what it was, and I just remembered it, which is revenge is best served old. Nice. Ooh, Ooh. Nice and ominous. As ominous as your story. You also have two stories in the anthology, which we can talk about in just a bit. But I got to ask all of you, first of all, are you horror fans? And if you are, what stories or creators inspired you? And if you're not, what inspired you to give it a try this time? And feel free to just jump in, my dear authors. I used to watch a lot of horror, but not write it. I don't really write well, so that counts as yeah, uh, watching horror. Yeah, my you know, biggest whole... inspiration is Guillermo del Toro. So there you go. Yeah, but this was my first crack at any kind of, and I, I don't, I wouldn't call mine horror. More like dark fantasy, not horror necessarily. That's pretty horrifying. You know, like <laughs> many people in my generation, I was scarred at a young age by one Stephen King, which is why oh, yes. I never ever set foot in the entire state of Maine. No, thank you. <laughs> Um, and horror is not my first love or my fifth or my 20th, but I married a horror lover. Uh, so I'm horror adjacent. Um, yeah, I birthed one, so I get it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this was, uh, a, a, I won't say it's a difficult foray. I read a lot of, of paranormal, uh, or, or fantasy or urban fantasy. Uh, and these stories are my first, uh, foot into into that realm. Um, I don't know how bloody it's going to get. I think it's going to surprise me. <sighs> does um does does being a horror fan include being um mesmerized by watching what's going on in Congress? <laughs> That's one. Is, you know, mesmer is mesmerized the verb we want to use there? I'm not quite yeah. sure. You know, horror it's, is it's about the of, control of tension. It's like it's, it's like horror. Schadenfreude, right? You can't look away. <laughs> Um, I'll say that uh, for someone that's like a real life witch that makes a lot of spooky work, I'm actually not a big horror fan because I'm a little bit of a baby um, and I scare very easily. Um, but and well, I will say my favorite horror story is Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. It's like queer. Well, Henry James is like queer canon to me, but the piece in in this anthology is less of a horror piece and more of like a contemporary queer comedy of manners with like land spirits. <laughs> so I would this is not my scariest story, um, but I'm usually a pretty big horror wimp, honestly. <laughs> I don't know if I'd really count my story as horror, but horror is actually my first love. I love horror everything. Scary movies, scary stories. I grew up reading Dean Koontz, Stephen King. I love Joe Hill, Grady Hendrix. Anything scary, I love it. I'm there. Excellent. I think the only really horrifying aspect of the story I wrote, Ghost Rider, is um, the concept of having more than 100 recipes with goat cheese in them. Ooh. You can never That's have a lot of cheese. Well, that's a lot of goat cheese. That's a lot of goat cheese. SD, actually, you bear some responsibility for my forays into Fantastic. horror. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the genre actually, to take this to a deeper, darker level, which I feel like is, is appropriate. On brand. It, it, yeah, right. It, it, it does allow especially queer writers to explore aspects of queer identity in a way that society often has exploited, but we can not even reclaim, um, but you know, life is horrifying and horror creates a medium to kind of process that. Also, you don't really know what's in your own head until you start writing and then as you said virginia you can be very I, i've been very surprised um pleasantly so i i actually want to want to jump off of that question um the association of queerness with horror um especially because historically 
um, we see any sort of queer rep was often tied up with horror, like examples like Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu showcasing lesbianism or Dracula showcasing queer subtext and polyamory by, um, by Bram Stoker, of course. And I'd love to know your thoughts on how we kind of see that perpetuated today and or what examples we see of that being reclaimed. <laughs> the fall of the House of Usher. Oh, my God. Yeah. That is the gayest thing I've seen in months. Uh, the director also did, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Bly Manor, I think, too, mm -hmm. which is another really excellent example. I've been watching Bly Manor was it? Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Wasn't Bly Manor a, a Henry James adaptation? Wasn't it a, a new adaptation of Turn of the Screw? Or am I mixing that up with something else? The Haunting of Bly Manor? Someone else will have to answer that. I haven't seen it yet. Right. You know, because Jake, everything in the end does come down to Henry James. You know, <laughs> it just does. I think all speculative, I'm like a huge speculative writer and speculative nerd. And for me, like horror is one subset of like, I think queer people and just like, I don't want to generalize too much, but a lot of marginalized people, I think really find a lot of joy in speculative fiction of all kinds, because they just deal with, it deals with problems that are hidden to the rest of society. It deals with things about yourselves or your daily reality that you can't tell other people about, but that might be troubling you. There's like so much wrapped up in, let's say a ghost story about like, oh, I can't even tell people about this really intense experience I'm having because like they won't believe me, which like if you're going through trauma as a queer person, you might be in an environment where you can't share what you're going through with people without outing yourself or like I think there's so much of the queer experience and maybe the marginal experience writ large to explore through speculative fiction and through horror just because it's like um it's the hidden world and like queerness in a lot of ways for so long less now but over the last hundred years in western society is like a hidden world in and of itself and so like I know so many queer fantasy fans so many like die hard queer horror fans because it's like we can we're used to having to find <laughs> metaphors for our experiences that are further afoot than like what a straight person would get when they were watching a movie or, or reading a book so I'm a huge I'm a, I'm going to shut up because I could talk. No, about this. it's great. No, that was perfect. That's great. <laughs> perfect. Nick, Wonderful. I think you and I are kindred spirits. I <laughs> love that answer so much. Yeah, I also think there's, uh, yeah, to second that, that was a beautifully articulate answer. It also allows for explorations of, particularly within body horror, right? You know, you, you can explore dysphoria, you can explore, you know, the effects of trauma, you can explore disability right i mean just and you can do so in ways that are terrifying or and but also it doesn't even have to fringe into the gorier edges right i mean you i think arguments could be made that there are even certain fairy tales right that are absolutely horrifying when you think about them or you think about the idea of someone turning into something else right i mean that's that, that that's a very queer that's very trans narrative um, so lots of potential. Fabulous. Well, cool. Well, we'll shift away from that for something a little more lighthearted for the moment. Um, gotta ask if you could romance a mythical monster, what would you choose? Ooh. It can be a specific one. It can be vampire generic. There are no rules. I gotta go with Grendel's mother. <laughs> excellent excellent yeah, choice yeah, yeah. angelina jolie body double yeah there you go yeah I, uh, I, you know, i'm thinking about this i'm pondering gorgons mm -hmm. but i'm looking for the downside give me a minute <laughs> <laughs> gotta close your eyes the whole time that's the downside is it blindfolded i don't know you know if the snakes were black i think it could work um <laughs> I, I, you know i'm pondering We can't have two Gorgons, so I'll I'll keep pondering. Yes, we can. No. You can totally Ursula, have two Gorgons. Ursula from The Little Mermaid. I've always had a very soft spot for. Uh, a fae, but like the old school kind of like 
very clever and tricksy and woodlandsy. Um, if I had to go with somebody in the zeitgeist from a fantasy thing, I'm going to give the cliche answer and probably say Henry Cavill in The Witcher right now. That's the modern. <laughs> <laughs> That tracks. Yeah, Samwise Gamgee was my first on-screen crush. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I like my. I I tend to like my monsters as monsters, but you know, nothing wrong they're, with that. You know, so I don't know. It's a tough one. How about Jen? Do you have any thoughts on the matter? I'd go with vampires. All right. They're the iconic classic queer horror icon. So yeah. perfect answer. There's a reason they're timeless and there's a reason they're so often a queer metaphor. It's true. Fashion sense. Fashion <laughs> sense. Yes. Timeless. Can mm -hmm. you imagine being a vampire and having to keep up with uh, the trends throughout the centuries, wanting to bring what, things back? The wardrobe budget. Oh my God. Getting mad oh, no. every time you throw things out and then 50 years later, it comes back into style. Oh, okay. How would you know black the... is always so slimming? I always go with David Bowie and the hunger. I think oh, yeah. a trendsetter that he just wouldn't have to change any of the wardrobe at all. True. <laughs> all right. So David Bowie is a vampire. Nick, conspiracy theory. All right, Virginia, did you ever figure out the downside of Gorgons? No, we're going to go with Gorgons. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't mind being courted by a vampire. I mean, mm. they do have flair. Oh, because that went so well in the story you wrote for Soul Foods. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, as long as I'm not part of the body count, that works. That's fine. All right. So I got to ask then, let's jump off that. What inspired the, unless you, uh, some of you kind of touched on it, but I'd love for you to elaborate. As far as your specific story in Soul Foods, was there any inspiration? Like, Jen, do you cook? Anna, are you a psychopath? You know, little things, little <laughs> things like that. Well, I will field that question first. The answer is yes. Yes. Um, I, first steps the admitting idea it, Anna. Um, it, it, exactly. But I have, there's no will to change here. I'm very happy the way That's okay. I am. That's um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just love the idea of a successful revenge strategy. And I have a, quite a few revenge plans that I legally cannot enact. So this seems a good use. It is satisfying, even when the main characters are the uh, victims. That would never happen. No, never. Well, I was going to say, Jake, you mentioned um, that you utilize like witch stuff in your everyday life. I got to know if that if that sort of concept with the spirits who appear in your story had any sort of influence. Yeah, I mean, all of my work or a lot of my work is, if not inspired by concepts I believe in or practice, it's like I'm always reading about this stuff and I'm taking inspiration from it. I will say of the Aaron Land um who okay i should just say it on a hot mic i i'm I, it's okay um it's the only story in my collection that's based on like really something that pretty much happened start to finish i mean the spiritual element i added after but like my <laughs> my really close friend got gay married in like 2019 um and this set of calamities did befall the lesbian food truck power couple catering the wedding um and so i don't know them at all uh but all we were all like oh someone has to write about this and they were like you have to because you're a fantasy writer and it's like this is too ridiculous that this happened so it's a real life thing that happened i had to ask my friend permission to publish it in the collection in the anthology because they have since been gay divorced since this story took place but it's like a real <laughs> of the air and land is like kind of a real story with spirits and ghosts mm. which is usually not what i do when i write like i'll pluck elements from you know things people say or do in the in the real world but this one was like almost start to finish what happens to these two people like was it true <laughs> Um, but then it was like, oh, well, obviously the spirit world was trying to tell them that they weren't meant to be together. Um, but yeah, that one is an actual, a real story. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Well, the, the, I feel bad, but <laughs> the, the, the little 
the little kernel of truth that that inspired me to write the story I wrote happened uh, years ago when I first joined Bywater Books and spent um, a drunken night with Kelly Smith and Marianne K. Martin. And we all decided it would be a whole lot of fun to write a straight up lesbian romance about two women in iron lungs. You know, I thought it had legs, sort of. So, you know, I kind of took the gem of that idea and then coupled it with my love of cooking and reading about cooking and food and the the great British writer MFK Fisher, who was Julia Child before we had Julia Child and thought, you know, what could I do to try to mesh those two things together and throw in an element of one of the two principles being not quite dead and not quite alive. So that's how my story came together. I love that. That's awesome. Well, Kathy and Virginia, you guys both alluded and mentioned explicitly in one case um, that your stories were prequels to some of your published works. Uh, do you want to tell us some more about that? Maybe pitch the book that it is. Tell me more. Virginia. <laughs> uh, Consecrated Ground is the, uh, the my novel Consecrated Ground is the story of a war witch who uses spellcraft to fight vampires. Um, it's very, uh, it was important in that novel to make the vampires not sexy. Um, but a sexy one snuck in anyway, even though she only gets a cameo because I have a heartbeat. Um, so, uh, that was always a character that, that needed, uh, a little bit of fleshing out, <clears throat> no pun intended. Um, and, uh, I intend to explore it in the sequel, but this was an opportunity to talk about her origins and to also play with the idea, uh, with a vampire that blood is not the only thing they hunger for. Um, and with, uh, with, uh, Elisabetta, it was very much a, how can we talk about women and power and ambition? Fantastic. I love that. I also want to say the eternal struggle as a fellow monster writer is that you can never make something unsexy to everyone. It's uh, I've learned the hard way that someone will latch on to the most brutal and disgusting and sometimes asexual of characters. Uh, Kathy, do you want to tell us a little bit about yours? <laughs> Sure. Uh, so my the novel uh, through Bywater is The Demon Equilibrium, and uh, it's about demon hunters in early uh, 1900s. Uh, they have to, um, let me see if I can get this out there, right? Their memories have been messed with. They've been, they need to figure out who they are and remember who they are and save the world, essentially. Well, you know. And you said this was like an origin that. story for the main character. This was yeah. an, one of the one of the characters, not necessarily a main character. Uh, one of the characters is Sister Thomasina. She's the uh, leader of the uh, Order of Saint Teresa, and she's the you know main teacher, uh, that uh, disciplinarian, the one who decides who is going to be matched up with who because my demon hunters are paired, and uh, she's a rather staunch lack of humor kind of person and i always wanted to figure out well why is she like this you know she's straight as an arrow you know there is no gray area with her it's this or that and when i was uh trying to figure out a story for this anthology salem suggested why don't you do a story on thomasina so tommy caldwell was born and there awesome. she is. How she, how she figured out who she was or started to. Fabulous. Yeah. So Jen, I do need to ask, cause I found your story to be both subtly horrifying and charming. And the, the, yeah. there's so much left unsaid at the end. I love, I love the open-ended implications of whatever's going to happen next. Not to like I'm dancing around spoilers, <laughs> you know, do you bake in real life? I do not. I like cooking, but I'm not patient enough for the precision and measurements that are required in baking. I just like to throw everything into a pot, but I wanted to write something kind of lighthearted, which Anna has suggested maybe I don't quite understand the meaning of, um, <laughs> but I wanted something kind of lighthearted and I wanted to include some sort of like Canadian thing. So I was like, let's pick like a Canadian food. And so I want these butter tarts. 
that I just thought sounded kind of quirky and fun to play with for the story. I love that. All right. Um, plus, I mean, I kind of get it. There is the uh, the sexy demon lady that uh, our main character is definitely totally not attracted to. No. So uh, who wouldn't sell her soul for fame and fortune and tarts and also... Well, sexy demon lady. Eternity. Yeah, sexy demon lady. Yeah. It really just depends on your ideals at that point, though. Maybe I'm just... Many. But yeah, so uh, excellent, excellent job, guys. I do need to ask, like totally, totally changing gears. Um, as far as being authors of LGBTQ literature, and I assume along the queer spectrum yourselves, are there like, because obviously all authors face challenges, but LGBTQ authors often face a very unique set of hurdles to overcome. It's it's kind of the mantra of you have to be twice as good to be taken half as seriously. And I'd love to know if you're willing to be vulnerable, um, what sort of unique challenges you specifically have faced in pursuing a writing career. Am I queer enough? Because um. on the surface... I, I'm married to a male. I've got kids. I've got the, you know, on the, you know, to look at it, a hetero life going on here. And, but I write queer characters and I am queer. And am I believable as a queer author? That's, that's my biggest challenge. But do you, do you feel like you face that pressure more from within the community then than externally? I, I don't know. Uh, it's probably actually more internal than anything. Oh, like inside you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Though, you know, every now and again, I, I get like, I get the feeling that I'm not, like I said, I'm not taken seriously as a queer author. Yeah. I don't I, know. Well, you know, not like, yeah, people like my stories, but. I think, the, I think the greatest challenge I have is an extension of that. You know, I feel like I'm not taken seriously as an author because I'm queer. Yeah. You know, you know, for me, at least that's been probably the, you know, the greatest hurdle is to, um, you know, get people past the point where, you know, when they say, what kind of books do you write and you tell them and they kind of go, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, uh huh. you know, and then to think about how the books are immediately, you know, categorized and classified right. and relegated. You know, we used to have a section in a bookstore, then we got part of a shelf and now we have two or three books and then we have none. And, you know, then we're always put in the section next to, um, you know, books about dysfunction and recovery, you know, but for me, it's just the struggle to be regard for our literature to be regarded as legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I went this sort of MFA route because I also wanted to teach and like, um, build a career as a fiction and poetry writer and all this stuff. Um, and I will say a challenge that feels very specific to MFA workshops. Uh, and this is not a call out of my school. This is a problem across the board is when there's a diversity problem in of any kind in an MFA workshop. In my case, if you're the only queer person in the workshop, uh, the whole structure of an academic workshop is that you're not allowed to speak at all about your work and you have to sit there and listen to everybody talk about it, which has a lot of value like i got a lot out of my experience but when you're in a room with pretty much all straight white men you do kind of even liberal leaning straight white men you just kind of have to uh, tolerate some prejudice and some like feedback that's couched in the language of craft and character but that's really a defense against a, maybe a prejudice that you're examining in the work like i write I write a lot of stuff that tries to challenge the patriarchy and challenge masculinity and things that like, if you're in a class full of even the best intentioned straight white men, like they can get really defensive about what you're writing about and they can take it out on you and there's nothing you can do and nothing you can say. And, um, so it's part of the reason, like my only friends from my MFA program that have lasted were like other queer people in the program or 
women or people of color because we would basically, if we were the only one who represented our identity in a workshop, we had kind of a tacit understanding that we would defend each other when the other person was silenced. Um, but that's a that was a particular kind of challenge to the workshop st structure is basically like the only person who's an authority on this experience can't speak and has to like listen to people's sort of prejudices about it. And again, it's not a call out to my program specifically this is a problem in every workshop of this structure is like if no one else represents your lived experience then your lived experience if it factors into your work at all is part of what's on the chopping block by people who have very little context to understand it um so that's challenging even before publishing just like getting navigating getting good feedback out of that and sorting through some of the pre more prejudiced feedback for like helpful truth and mm -hmm. critique yeah that was a really a very challenging thing um yeah be happy to second that the mfa workshop is effective a wonderful model and it is also like everything else in this world uh, deeply flawed in, in many ways and i also got my MFA so that I, I could teach. And now as a teacher, I, I, I do see that from from both sides too. And at least in my position, I am now able to speak up and protect those students. And if nothing else, I feel like I've done that at least for the world. Uh, <laughs> or, or, well, the world, those students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just had an incident recently. Um, I, I also think that we... It's it's only been in the past five years, if even, that we've seen mainstream fiction start to take queer stories seriously. I mean, when I was pitching my, my novel to Bywater, I didn't even consider that the, any subsidies of the big five or four now, uh, they, because they're just they they weren't publishing. So the fact that we don't we we have a we do have platforms, we have the small presses and. I worry deeply about how our small queer presses will do because I have absolutely no faith that mainstream publishing will continue to be supportive. They they will as long yeah. as it's profitable. When it's yeah. no longer profitable, then they'll drop it and it won't mean anything. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. So even you know even having a place to have our stories be, be told is at risk constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you look at, I don't know, Florida. Bands, book bands. Mm -hmm. Which actually is the reason Salem West had to leave a little early because she's on her way to participate in a Pen America panel on yep. book bands right oh, now. That's right. I saw mm -hmm. the notifications about that. Mm -hmm. Which, oof, that's a whole topic in and of itself, but uh, we, we'll jump to that later if we have time. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Virginia or Jen, do you have anything to add to that? Well, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging for me to look at this because in some ways, in a lot of ways, I am a... Gen X West Coast elite. Right, which basically means if you talk any smack, I start ignoring you, and I it doesn't affect me at all. Um, uh, so my experience uh, as a dyke, and and that's my turn to claim. Thank you very much. Um, has been way better than I could have imagined. I have an accepting family. I live in an accepting community. I have an accepting job. Uh, and I live in the People's Republic of Portland. I mean, I pretty much won the lottery on that front. Um, I will say that, and excuse me, <laughs> I'm a new author. <clears throat> Jen, you go, I'll come right back. Um. I guess I feel really fortunate to be writing and publishing now at the time I am, because I feel like one of the benefits to publishing as a queer author was this great community that I was like welcomed into. And um, yeah, that kind of goes to Anna's point about the importance of protecting these like indie presses that are pushing these stories out there, because it's so important that we can continue to have these places to tell our stories and, um, 
yeah, for our voices to continue to be heard. Well, I think, I think too, like if I can, if I can do this, um, you know, one of the things that we all share, those of us in this group that, that I think we're really fortunate about when we think about small legacy presses and indie presses is, you know, Bywater Books doesn't put out cookie cutter books. We're not, you know, Bywater is not going to put out, you know, 150 books with exactly the same plot and different covers or, you know, go down the line and check off the various tropes that people are wedded to. I think Bywater takes chances on the stories that it that it produces, and they're willing to risk that with us. They're willing to take the stories that we have to tell that are maybe a little more quirky and maybe a little less formulaic, maybe a little edgier, maybe books that aren't going to go out and sell, you know, a million copies, but that they're important stories that from voices that need to be heard. And I feel that as long as we can keep presses like the one we're all part of viable, we've got a shot at, at surviving. So thank you I, I feel, you and I feel blessed by that because it, the thing that, that um, I have only recently as a new author begun to experience is <clears throat> there's queer lit and nothing but love and respect to Jake, Anna, and Anne those of you who are extremely talented in that realm. Uh, and there's pulp genre, which is my first love. Uh, and I like to think that I am developing my work to be somewhere between the two, which means it's really difficult to find a, a bucket to put that in, right? Uh, um, I want to write, <clears throat> for example, paranormal or uh, better yet, spec thick, because honestly my first love is hot chicks with big guns in space. Um, I want the, but those stories, I need them to pack a punch, right? I need them to be more than, and, and I don't say this as a disrespect to romance, which is, is a genre I love, uh, but I need my stories to be something more than that. Um, but <clears throat> you know, I don't think that they're going to be, um, necessarily, uh, or at least I fear that they will be perceived as less than works that have more of that queer lit quality and weight, if you will. That's what um, I've heard it called ascended gay literature. So as opposed to queer literature, it's literature that happens to be queer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, it's definitely uh a different you you feel very out of place because are you put with the queer authors are you queer enough or are the the heterosexuals going to completely dismiss you outright you know yeah and that ties into the, a question that looks like it was dropped into the chat here yes um kind we of can talk about that actually yeah. Yeah, so um, here it is. Katie Ross asks, uh, well, she says, I'm having a hard time formulating this as a coherent question, but maybe someone else can. On the topic of queerness and fitting in within larger literary communities, I'm curious how that might interact with the whole genre fiction versus literary fiction divide. And upon asking for clarification, um, it's looking to be more discussing how the world sort of privileges literary fiction over genre fiction, which I think actually, yeah, it does tie in really well to Virginia's statement. Um, I'd love to know if you guys have any experience with that as sort of a, a prejudice against your stories, or if you're more of the literary type, if um, you've seen any sort of dismissal of the others, quote unquote. Well, welcome to our TED Talk. Welcome to <laughs> academia. I was actually going to ask you if you had anything more to add about the academic circle, because um, I'll tell you, In the Roses of Pyria deals a lot with the academic world, and Anna has a lot of personal experience with that. Mm -hmm. And I love academia, um, but you, you can love things that are deeply, deeply, deeply flawed. As, as, as far as this... So I... I received a your usual residential MFA in creative writing, um, but now I teach in Emerson College's popular fiction program, um, and by program I mean MFA. So I'm in this kind of privileged position where I, you know, I, I had my own MFA experience, which very much privileged literary fiction. There were professors who, you know, you just didn't take their workshop if you were writing speculative fiction because they would flat out say, uh, we don't read dragons. Um, 
which which is like such a I always thought that was so funny, you know, like, what is it about a dragon that draws the line there? But now that I am teaching popular fiction, right, you know, it's just so, even within those genres, I, I guess is kind of where I'm wandering somewhat aimlessly towards. There's, if you were to break popular fiction down as well, well, everyone you know looks down upon romance right i mean that 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 does seem to be even within that realm even though romance is what sells by far Um, and away by far genre yep uh so i don't know you know it's just it's i may have had a coherent a coherent point at one point um (laughs) i I think i think what i'm trying to say is that it, it it makes me sad as a writer and, and especially as a queer writer to see my community and any community just, there's always a reason to look down, right? There, people are always looking for that thing. Oh, you know, okay, well, it's not literary fiction or, oh, well, you know, it, it focuses too much on, on, you know, why are you writing about horror? You know, why are, so, so there's just, we are just so primed to, but, yeah. But here, But here's the thing, right? And we all know this. Good writing is good writing, mm-hmm. regardless of whether it's genre fiction or literary fiction. It doesn't matter if it's horror or romance or erotic erotica or you know whatever. We can we can we can tell stories and we can write them well, and that's our challenge. You know that's our challenge when we write is to do that and to always strive to be better, regardless of what bucket we end up in. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. No, I agree. And I think that every one of us here could come up with some example of something that we've read in the last six months, year, five years, that is outside of something that you would normally choose for yourself, but it turned out to be so amazing or so highly recommended or so powerful that you, that you strayed from your own comfort zone or your own norm to read something new. Um, and, uh, and, and Anne's right. I think in, in some ways we all contribute to that and give readers those opportunities. Yeah, I have a, I'll try to keep it brief because I have a lot to say about this subject matter too. A lot of what Anna time. Go on really and resonates. Um, but like, yeah, the same in academia, there is just, there's a, there's an attitude that anything speculative is just inherently less valuable than psychological realism. And I try to be very, I'm almost to a pedantic degree, it's not literary fiction and genre fiction. It's psychological realism and speculative is the spectrum. And because like pulp, for for instance, pulp romance, pulp crime novels have more to do with psychological realism than speculative fiction, right? Like stuff that follows the laws of physics and stuff like you don't, we don't claim, I don't claim, and I have no, no, no shade to romance or crime or anything like that. But like, I don't claim those genres because they have nothing to do with like even the pulpiest fantasy that I like to write or that I like to read. Like it's, uh, but in academia, like if you write speculative fiction, if you're not Amy Bender or the basically, basically Amy Bender and like the Latin American magic realist movement, uh, academics grudgingly accept as literary. And the thing that makes me so crazy about this is that just in terms of the history of fiction writing, um, the first picaresque, uh, picaresque in uh, Western history is The Golden Ass, which is a ridiculous fantasy novel about a horny guy that gets turned into a donkey by a witch. You know what I mean? That is the first evidence of something like a novel we have in Western history. The first evidence of something like a short story have is myths and fairy tales and folk tales Mm -hmm. and things like Mm -hmm. that. So like I get really, as you can see, I'm not a very confrontational person, but I get really fired up about this issue because it's like 
to denounce speculation in fiction as sort of low art is like to deny the history of the genre in this way that makes me crazy. And it, it's the same way that Western history tries to erase queerness and tries to erase marginal identity. Uh, and it's not, I don't mean to conflate the two. I certainly don't mean to be like, this is a colonialist thing, but the, the, the erasing of the history of the genre is makes me feel the same way that the that people are like, oh yeah, queerness and non-binary identity and trans identity are new things and they're something that to be taken less seriously or whatever. It's like both of these things have been around for a long time. And like again, I think it's no coincidence that queer people and a lot of people of other marginalized identities really gravitate towards speculative fiction. And I think these things are always like tangled up together for me. And so sometimes to me, people denigrating genre or speculative fiction feels the same way as dem denigrating queer fiction and like comes from a lot of the same historical erasure that like really bothers me. So I'll stop because if I had kept in academia and gotten a PhD, this probably would have been my dissertation topic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, ta I, I have heated arguments with colleagues about this or used to all the time. Excellent. No, and I, I absolutely echo that sentiment. Something that I strongly believe is that speculative fiction is an incredible way to often allegorically explore modern problems. Um, I believe that spec fic writers have to be really careful um, of accidentally stating some sort of metaphor that they don't believe. Um, a really inspiring quote that I heard on a panel years ago at, at Phoenix Comic Con of all things was, if you don't know your message, someone else will. You have to be aware of the environment of your time. You have to know um, if you might be saying something that could be taken a very wrong way. And there's actually, it was a reference to a horror panel specifically um, and talking about the fallout from um, the rise of the uh, slasher genre specifically and uh, how, I don't remember, I think they referenced Scream specifically and how the concept of the final girl came out, but also the, uh, how the, the, the more promiscuous gal was always the first to die. And because there was no lesson attached to that, that the director was aware of people grabbed onto that and went, look at this, this is a punishment for being yourself. That mm -hmm. was a slight tangent, but this is a topic I also feel very strongly about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, let's, if, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, so separate from that, but, but sort of adjacent to some earlier statements, I'm thinking a lot about the, um, the, and maybe it's just because it's it's a corner of the world that I'm paying attention to, but the number of um, Afrocentric, Afro uh, futurist uh, um, authors who are dancing in spec fic um, or dancing in horror, and I don't want to say it's a resurgence uh, because I think resurgence is a dangerous term. It's kind of like talking about trans uh, folks and um, non-binary folks being brand new. Actually, these things have been here the whole time. You're just paying attention now. Uh, and by you, I mean greater, you know, middle America dominant paradigm, whatever, which is my nice way of saying white folks because I'm outnumbered here. Um, <laughs> Oh, but be as mean as you we want. can take it. We're hostage. Yeah. Oh, I'm not worried about y'all. Um, so, so I, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged. I think uh, by, uh, and I will get these names wrong, but Marlon James and uh, Nettie Okorafor and um, Octavia Butler's uh, ongoing resurgence. Um, Amen. And, uh, you know, so many of these authors who. Uh, some of them are, of course, exploring these these deeper topics, um, uh, uh, particularly Butler, who is so prescient. I'm still reeling constantly. Um, but then I think about things, um, uh, and, and some of you may not be aware of this, but things like Fire Lit Magazine, which is um, uh, a really small subscription uh, uh, literary magazine that focuses just on Black spec fic. Um, and how the other conversations that have happened in our society in the last few years, which ebb and flow, uh, right now we're, we're uh, kind of uh, experiencing the ebb 
uh, as far as BLM and, you know, post-2020 and 2021 grand scheme, whatever. Um, but uh, those those kinds of, of stories and, and those kinds of um, uh, folks writing those stories, um, it, it, it helps it, to, for me to see that they are exploring other ways of viewing horror and speculative fiction that are not always mired in some of the concepts that we've been talking about here. They're from a completely different lens, exploring completely different story rhythms and um, story structures and uh, different aspects of human experience. And um, I, I love these moments in in, in our world where, uh, where we get exposed to those things and it, it kind of turns on the lights on some new ideas and some new ways of expressing the, the genre stuff that I already love. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Love it. There's a, there's a book I own. It's called, I believe the Feminomicon, I might be saying it wrong. And it's a dissertation on dissertation, but it's a, it's a book detailing various female monsters throughout uh, different cultures and something I was really with like absolutely gorgeous illustrations. And something I was really impressed with was how multicultural it was. Um, they really made an attempt to reach out to just every country it felt like so i hey, really appreciate that. that that sounds fantastic let me yeah i'll put that in a link in the chat when we're done because right. i have to leave my desk to grab it for you um if you oh i wanted to say if you want to put a link to that uh magazine you mentioned into the chat i think a lot of people would really enjoy checking that out on it excellent thank you virginia all right so we are in the last couple minutes so i want to switch to something a little more lighthearted. Um, after that absolutely incredible discussion. Thank you, everybody. So jumping off the what monster would you romance? What monster would you be? Pros and cons. Ooh. I don't know you well enough to reveal that yet. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Virginia, we'll talk later because now I have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Demon. Demon. Excellent. Well, that's so open-ended. Demon can mean anything. I think like an All imp, kinds of demons. if I had to narrow like it down. Demon. Excellent. Like, tricky, but not like so heinous, you know? Mm -hmm. I love Carrie Lake, but you use your powers for good. Or powers for mischief could be good. You're, you're the he ultimate anti-hero. <laughs> More like a Crowley from Good Omens, Demon. Chaotic neutral, man. Chaotic neutral. Speaking of, everybody should watch Good Omens on Amazon Prime. I absolutely love it. Need to catch up on second season. It's <laughs> great. But that's a thing I'll go off on, so we don't have time for that. I'm always torn on this question, right? There are just so many options, and it opens up so many different possibilities. But I think if I were to be true to myself and really dig down into the depths of my soul, I would be a will-o'-the-wisp and I would just lure people into the woods. I, <laughs> that just what, would you, is, what would you do with them then? Sell them insurance? I mean, well, I don't, that's what for me to know and for you to find out when I learn. For me to get woods. lured and find out. Don't, don't follow the lights, Anne. Don't follow the lights. <laughs> <laughs> he is the light at that point. I I feel like my initial answer that I'm going to go with would probably be to be like a ghost because I feel like that fits with my introverted nature, but yeah. I could really be like Ultimate lurking. lurking about meddling with things. Mm -hmm. But but can you not die? Like you personally, don't, die. don't, don't do that. Well, you know, at some later, point, then I can be a ghost. But also, okay, if we were the vampires from what we do in the shadows, like I want to say bat, and I want to be a bat. Awesome. So um, we have a really good final question in the chat before we kind of start signing off. Um, it seems uh, Elizabeth Anderson asks, it seems that small queer presses are increasingly ignored by LGBTQ awards in favor of books the bit from the big mainstream presses yep. that reduces visibility for small publishers and authors. How do we affect change there? It's hard Yell about the books you love. It's hard. I mean, the big presses have the deep pockets yeah. and, you know, they they do patronage. They give money. They 
do sponsorships, they buy full page ads, they do all the things that that small presses don't don't have the pocketbooks to do. So it's hard to compete with that. What what happens is when you're really lucky and you score somebody like Anna Burke, you know, who regularly shows up at Forward Reviews or in the New York Times, you know, then you have a shot at at pulling some visibility in, you know, for your press. Apart I from think like on an individual level, we can all make sure that we're reading from those small independent presses and Amen, yeah. buying those books and supporting those companies. And how about, and, how about talking about them? You right. Know, if you read about, something, like, say something, that's exactly. my, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> put just a, a little bit out there, you know, a, a rating, a short yeah. little, Hey, I love this book. <laughs> Tell it to yeah. a friend. Yeah. I mean, that's, what's going to get, get people's ears is, Oh, well, that person liked that book. And I like that kind of book. And <laughs> You know, Your five yeah. star review on Goodreads really does go far, even if it's it just does. I like this book. Yeah, it yeah increases exactly. the algorithm. That's all we need. You're, if you have three followers on Instagram and you're posting your favorite books, we love that. You know, that's just a little bit more a drop in the bucket, but you have enough drops. Right. You got you got an ocean. So right. And there have been a lot of um, queer indie books that have gone mainstream because of word of mouth and places like TikTok and other social media where things can blow up. Mm -hmm. Like your book. Well, that that was a strange <laughs> series of circumstances. <laughs> but I, I do, um, looks like Julie just, just posted about oh. some of the really cool things that... Uh, our, our community does. And so I think, you know, if we just continue to stay involved together as a community, yeah, yeah. that that's not going to go anywhere. Um, yeah. And as long as there's a community, we will continue. To the, the other thing that we can do that will have an impact is we can volunteer and we can make ourselves available to, to right. some of these organizations as readers and judges. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it takes a ton of time and nobody really wants to do it. But I mean, it's, it's another way that you can really have an impact, you know, to make sure that, you know, that books from small legacy presses are not overlooked. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, so it looks like we are at two o'clock. Well, two o'clock my time. We're at the hour. So I think drum roll, we get to announce the giveaway winner. So I would like to say congratulations to Kate Pringle. Are you in the chat? Can you give me a wave in the chat so I know you're here? Give her, give, give her a minute. No. You got one minute. Oh, man. Um, I'm yeah, going to do a sign off before I call another winner. No, um, she's here. She's here. Oh, here. Is that her? Looks like it. There she Hooray! is. Awesome. So, uh, Kate, if you filled out the Google Docs form, which I will post again, um, we'll make sure that your prize is included with uh, your stuff. Just make sure you put your first and last name. Let me post that one more time into the chat. So, again, everybody, if you want to fill out the Google Sheets, you will be sent your very awesome door prize. So, as a sign-off, can we have all the authors tell us where to find you online, on your website, social media, anything? And you're welcome to post your links in the chat as well. I got all my posted right here on my head. Excellent. <laughs> VirginiaBlackWrites.com. Uh, yeah. You can find me everything everywhere is, yeah. Hit Sarah me up on Blue Sky, game. though. That's like the most fun thing lately. I'm enjoying. I'm Blue getting Sky over is. there more. It's, yeah. It's good stuff. Hang on a second. I'm on Instagram at DreamBabyJake, and I want to throw out there, because I've been touring for my collection of short stories, I have a graphic posted there for where I'll be. If you are if you are in Chicago, Ann Arbor, Buffalo, Charlottesville, or um, Salem, Massachusetts, please check out i have some events in the next few weeks i would love to see your face uh or have a coffee with you or whatever great oh goodness gonna have to fly across the country now <laughs> <laughs> when you just stay in to baltimore salem. you're welcome oh gladly go to salem don't tempt mm -hmm. me all right anna where can we find you i don't know if you posted your stuff um I did somewhere. Oh, there you I'm, are. I'm, yeah, I'm on most platforms as 
Anna Brick author. Um, I'm hoping to become more active on those platforms again in the relatively near future. There's just, there's been some stuff, um, right? But we all, we all have stuff. I also, I have a Patreon um, and, you know, if you wander too far into the woods, maybe you'll find me. <laughs> Summon Don't her follow. by chanting mushroom in a mirror three times in a cold, dark <laughs> night. I'm um, I'm on um, Facebook, um, Instagram, Blue Sky, at, at Ann McMahon, also annmcmahon.com. And you can also find me at bywaterbooks.com. Yes. Yeah. I'm just find all of us. Yeah, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> Please. I'm, I'm just me, Kathy Pega. However you want to pronounce it. So... <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm ST Simper. Once again, you can find me at stsimper.com or at ST Simper on any platform if you care to do so. But hey, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It was a great turnout. I'm really stoked with how this went. Uh, final reminder to put your information into the door prize form. Uh, congratulations again to Kate Pringle. And honestly, everybody have a great day. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ST. Thank you. Really good thank to you, see thank you. Thanks, ST. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay out of the woods. <laughs>